Hi, uh, hi, Lena. How are you? Hi, Tony. How are you? Great to be here today. For the benefit of the audience, I'm Tony Aldarondo, Executive Director of the Melissa Institute for Violence Prevention and Treatment. And today I have the honor of uh, talking with uh, Dr. Lena Augimeri, uh, Director of the Center for Children Committing Offenses and the SNAP International Headquarters at the Child Development Institute in Toronto. Um, Dr. Augimeri has uh, dedicated her life to the development, implementation, evaluation, and dissemination of a comprehensive mental health and crime prevention model, which has been adopted uh, around the world for children engaged in antisocial and disruptive behavior. Um, we are super excited um, because we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Augimeri uh, with us on January 22nd. Uh, she will be our opening act for the year 2021 on our series of innovations on violence prevention. Uh, she'll be talking to the title of her presentation uh, and the course will be Preventing Tomorrow's Criminals, a Comprehensive Children's Mental Health and Crime Prevention Framework, Responding to Children with Serious Disruptive Behavior Problems by Raising the Bar. So uh, we're, we are looking forward to having you um, in that ex exciting course and there'll be information at the bottom, you know, uh, the page for people to register and find out more about it, as well as we will list any, any kind of materials and information that Dr. Augumeri tells us that she wants to share with you. And um, looking forward to that opportunity. Uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, Dr. Augumeri. Very excited and please call me Lena. Okay. Um, very excited to be involved with this and it is a real honor and pleasure being involved with the Melissa Institute. I look so forward to this. The presentation I'm going to do is really is on who are these kids? Okay. What do we know about them? What should we think about? What should communities think about? You know, I loved the fact, you know, when I did, started doing more research on the Melissa Institute, and I have for years, um, because I know that Dr. Deborah Pepler, for example, who, yes. you know, brought me into the field, um, was with the Melissa Institute as well. And, she used to you know, do this. Yeah. yeah, and so when Don, Mike, and Baum taught me, you thought Don, Mike, <laughs> because yeah. it's kind of funny. But what I loved about, I, I really do partner with those that take the full perspective that how do we keep our community safe yeah. is first and foremost what anybody wants whether you're a parent or whether you're a civilian like or you're part of society but what i loved what they did and you know tony it's hard because you know when i read about it my heart just you know was like oh, because i too have a 25 and 29 year old daughter daughters too yes. my first daughter's name is melissa yes. <laughs> and so when i thought about it i thought oh my gosh like she was just on her way back to school with her friend and this tragedy happened and it can happen like that and it can happen yes. like that to anybody and yeah. i think we have to ask ourselves why why do these things happen? What is going on in our community, in our society that can make somebody take these two innocent girls and do what they did to them? Right. Okay. Absolutely. Or harm somebody or do these things. So my whole life for the last 35 years, um, I grew up in, I don't know if you read that um, book chapter bio that somebody wrote about me was I grew up with three brothers and we grew up in a um, community off where the airport was. And, you know, when we, we started, when I was growing up, I grew up with three, these three boys. I was the only girl coming from a very traditional family. My mom's Italian, my dad was Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had certain um, expectations of what a girl was like and what a boy was like, right? And, um, but I saw that not only in my own family, we all came from the same family, but I started to understand that there, you can come from the same family, have say three boys, and this is what I was learning from the research, was that one boy might be okay, one boy, boy might get in trouble, but get back on track, and one might not, one might not make it. One might engage in activities that they shouldn't or have serious mental health problems. And I wanted to know why. What was it about it? Was it genetic? Was it nature? 
nurture, nurture nature, what was it? Was it? Um, and so I've always been fascinated about that. And so even within my own life, I used to see kids who, you know, came from, you know, not so great families and they didn't make it. But I also saw kids who came from great families and they didn't make it. So what is it about their life circumstances that can cause them to engage in these kind of activities? And for me, I kept thinking we need to see not that we abdicate their responsibility because they are responsible for their actions. Mm -hmm. Okay. No ifs, ands, or buts. You are responsible for you. You're responsible for your actions. But I also started to engage and we started to engage in risk assessment. So I don't know if you've seen these. These right. are risk assessment tools. Yeah. We've just, we're, we're combining them now. So they're going to be one and it'll be released this year. And I think mm -hmm. Kathy Burgos in Miami, that's how I started 20, almost 20 years ago in 2000 two, three, four, started to engage with Miami, was what was it about certain kids that engaged them in activities um, like antisocial behavior, like, for example, theft and shoplifting and assault and violence? What was it about those kids that were different or possibly what was going on? And over the years, we have heard so much now about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, right? And that these adverse childhood experiences start to impact neurodevelopment and cause kids to not stop and think before they act and impact the developing brain and goes on and on. So that is what my life work has been about is thinking about who are these kids. And as I started to get to know these kids, they're incredible kids, but they didn't have the opportunities that they maybe should have had. Um, and they didn't maybe have the nurturing like they should have had. And there's a lot of things that are impeding their development. Doesn't abdicate their responsibility. Again, I want to make that clear. But how do we help these kids? Especially, we have an opportunity under the age 12, right? And there's something, there's an incredible stat came, coming out of the U.S., which was um, by the late Dr. Rolf Lober and others, which was seven years of warning or a seven-year incubation period which is um, if you go back into the records of kids that are 14 and a half and they're already committed a serious file on the fence and are in court for committing that very serious file on the fence. If you go back into their records, you will see that they started having minor problems at age six and seven. By the time they were nine, they were engaging in some activities like maybe theft and shoplifting. And before their 12th birthday, they commit some sort of serious delinquent offense. And by 14, they're in court for committing a serious violent offense. Seven years of warning, seven year incubation period. Think about how many individuals, because six to seven, six to 14, right? Or seven to 14, seven years, seven year incubation period. Think about how many individuals may have crossed that child's life. These kids are supposed to be in school. How many teachers, how many educators, how many professionals? So we have a responsibility as a society to help all our children. Um, and that's what my mission has been about, is when you look at me, so when I show the video, for example, when I do our, when I do our webinar, it's when you look at me, what do you see? Right? So you see all kinds of things, but you don't see me, right? You don't see that inner person, that child that may have experienced trauma, may have experienced adverse childhood experiences, may have experienced who knows what. Again, not that it abdicates a responsibility. So we have seven years before they are 12. And the older they get, the more difficult it is to change that behavior. Not that it's impossible, I believe in hope and I believe people can change, but with the right treatment and the right intervention and the right modalities, these kids can change, they can get better, mm -hmm. but we have to give them the opportunities. We have to create the environment that's going to help these kids. So you need to move the needle in the right. You have to move the needle. And how do we move the needle? So mm -hmm. when I think about the, 
um, comprehensive crime prevention strategy that we've been developing for the last 35 years. It is about, the first thing is we started with SNAP. We started with an evidence-based program that we've been building for over 35 years that was designed specifically to meet the needs of young kids under the age of 12 with conduct type problems or serious disruptive behavior yeah. problems that would put them at risk of flipping in to the juvenile justice system at 12 and older. So we learned from implementing that program that there were other things that needed to come in place first. Like for example, does a community have a really good referral mechanism bringing together key stakeholders like the police, like fire service, like child welfare, like schools, like mental health centers, like community-based organizations. Are they working together to build safety nets to catch these kids early? And that's one of the things I loved what was happening in Miami at the Juvenile Assessment Center, the Jack, when I got to work with Kathy Burgos and her team was how do we build safety nets first of all, to catch these kids early. Not to, put to them in, not to put them into juvenile justice system, because I'll tell you right now, we should not be putting under 12s in juvenile justice systems. These are kids in need of protection. And so how do we protect them? How do we provide the right services for them? So that's the first thing. How do you, do you have a good community referral mechanism? to get these kids to the door in a timely manner. And unfortunately, we have so many waiting lists. You might have a one-stop number, but you can't have these kids waiting on these waiting lists for a year or two. Because I know that in some communities, people are waiting over two years for SNAP. That's not the way the program was designed at all. It was within, within 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, you would have a telephone call saying, hi, I'm Lee Nodge, Mary. How can I help you and your family? How can I help you get your child on the right path here? What's going on? So that's the first thing, is these referral mechanisms, which is building these safety nets. The second piece is, once they come to your door, and this is how I got to Miami, was do you have a really good way to assess them for level of risk and need? Okay, so everybody is different. Everybody's risks are different. These are complex cases that need complex solutions. So having a really good structured risk need assessment tool that looks at individual factors like child factors, individual family factors, and then responsivity. How responsive is the community going to be to, the, to this child? How responsive is the child gonna be and how responsive is the family gonna be? So those are examples. So do you have a way to get them to the door? safety net? Do you have a way to assess them, to assess them for their levels of risk and need? And then do you have evidence-based, and I'm going to use that, evidence-based proven solutions to help them? With limited resources and limited dollars, we have a responsibility to ensure that the programs that we are giving our children and our families and our communities work. Work. And are we evaluating them to make sure that we're not doing more harm than good? Are we making sure that um, we're able to give these kids the resources and services they need? So there's lots that goes with each of those buckets, but in, in a nutshell, if you think about it, that's kind of what we've been working with over the last 35 years. I, I must say that I, was, uh, I knew about your work. I had not really read it in detail until um, we, we, we started to interact more frequently and, mm -hmm. um, and um, I was very, I've been very impressed by how comprehensive it is and by your attention to multiple, um, if you will, units of intervention. Like you are, you're dealing with the community, you're dealing with the law enforcement, you're dealing with the kids, you're dealing with the parents, you're dealing with the teachers, you're dealing, and for each of them you seem to have your own and set of commitments and set of techniques and things that you do, which I think is wonderful. I think it's really, really Thank you. Well, yeah. if you, if, and I appreciate you saying that because a lot of communities will say, well, isn't that expensive? Mm -hmm. Isn't that going to be expensive? Your leading scientists have mm -hmm. found in the U.S., Dr. Mm -hmm. James C. Howell, um, um, David Farrington, for example, in the U.K., mm -hmm. um, Alex Picaro, for example, world renowned one in the U.S. as well, these scientists have found that either you do this now 
or you spend the money later. You pay it. And the, and the pay is not only financial, it's emotional, it's physical, it's safety. Mm -hmm. It is everything you could imagine. And so when I do my presentation, I'm going to actually share a case, the mm -hmm. case of Tyler, for example. And it shows from birth all the way to age 25, all the things that actually happened to this young person from birth to 25. And the costs associated with those acts and with those activities that happened to this young person. And so what we know from the research is that you either spend something like on average 5,000 for a SNAP kid, for example, today, or you can spend up to 1.5 to $6.5 million later. You do the math, you decide what works. So for every dollar you spend today, you can save on average 36 up to 56, for a child going through a program like SNAP, or you're going to pay huge in the long run. And I, and I was listening to a colleague of mine speak, um, Andrew Steele, years ago, when we were getting involved with SNAP, deciding we were gonna scale across the country, which was in Canada, for example. Mm -hmm. And we were gonna use a very unique model called venture philanthropy, which means that government organizations, foundations can't do this alone. It needs a collective approach to make this work. Okay, we didn't get here overnight. It's not gonna go away overnight. So how can we work together? How do we all come together, which is government, foundations, the philanthropic community, business sector, um, to really create massive social change. And this venture philanthropy model looks at how do we all pull our dollars together to make this work and select evidence-based programs that we can then scale. Now, I truly believe in this. If you're gonna select my program, I would say, hold me accountable. Hold me accountable, hold my team accountable to make sure that this is going to work. And what that means is when you do implementation, so the whole field of implementation science is not easy, it's new. It's been around for a long, long time. People have been implement, implementing program for years, but have we actually been doing it and doing it right and have we been monitoring them so in the field of implementation science is we need to make sure that these programs are being delivered with high fidelity and integrity and how do we do that it is by working with the organization that is implementing the program to make sure it's working to make sure that they are delivering it the way it was intended to be delivered. Because if it is, then you're going to get the outcomes that you know it can get. And this is what this is what my colleague said, you know, he was talking about um, the overall cost and he says, you know, let me repeat that because why this is crucial. He said, left untreated, a child with chronic disorder will cost the system 800% more than an average child. 800% more, right? And so when we think about it, we have to think about what is it that these kids need? And when we, I liked what you said earlier when you said how we need to think about it being comprehensive, yeah. that not a one fit shoe fits everybody. That would be wrong. I it would be wrong for me to say that if you have SNAP, it's the only program you need. Right. That's false. And we have to be very careful when people say things like that. Right. We need many different programs to meet the very complex needs of our kids and our families and our communities. Yeah. And know, so one, the one thing, yeah. one thing that is you, your comment just made me realize too is that intervening early is not only uh, does not only pays off, the return on the investment is not only significant for that particular child and uh, family and community, but it's really multi-generational. Right. So that's a piece that we often don't think about when we're trying to understand and evaluate the impact of prevention strategies and violence prevention strategies. Because if we move the needle, right. the disruption that we are preventing in the life of this, gener this kid and their associates, you know, friends and families and their families. You know, the, if you look at the ACE work and so on, you know, you pass it on. Absolutely. And uh, so the, the, um, the Supreme Court was so exciting about this type of work, you know, that it really galvanizes resources now to make it better and into the future. You're absolutely right. You invest now yeah. for later. Yeah. So you either pay now or you pay later.
-hmm. So I always talk about, is that going to make your problem smaller? Or is that going to make your problem bigger? It's the same concept. And what I really liked about what you're saying about the, um, the multi-component mm -hmm. aspect of the work we've been doing is that is like one shit fit, shoe fit doesn't fit all. Is that one concept is that we're all different. And so when you assess them for level of risk and need, you are going to determine what are the needs of that particular child and their family within the within the scope of their community so for example that's why in, in our program we look at you know we offer the very first thing we do is we know that one of the critical factors is that these kids lack how to stop and think before they act okay so if we think about all of us and we think about when we made an error or when things didn't go great was it that we were able to stop and think before we act or did we just act or react? And so therefore that is the whole concept of the underlying underlying thread that that is SNAP, what SNAP is all about. It's about SNAP stands for stop now and plan, which is the key aspect is how do we teach these kids how to stop and think before they act and make better choices in the moment. So think about those young men who ended up taking Melissa and her friend did they stop and think before they act? Think about anything in our lives, right? So it's those kind of things that we have to think about. So that's the under, so self-control and emotion regulation, when you look at the literature, is a key aspect for helping kids who are engaged in antisocial behavior or conduct type problems or disruptive behavior, is how do we give them those skills to learn to stop and think before they act? So right. just to show you what's how SNAP works, just so you can understand that, if you think about a stoplight, yeah. right? A red light, yellow light, red, uh, green light. Yeah. Something happens, it really pisses you off, makes you angry. How does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, I don't like. It makes you feel angry, frustrated. Yeah. And when you're angry and frustrated, what happens to you? You don't, you don't think as clearly. You want to remove the pain, remove the source of... Uh, Right. right. But, but when you ask these kids, they'll say, I want to beat the shit out of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or I want to hurt them or I want to hit them. Right. I'm feeling tight. I'm feeling tense. My hands yeah. go into fists. These are normal reactions. It's how we handle them that yeah. will make our problem bigger. So that's where we automatically say you need to use a snap. Okay. Yeah. You have to stop. You know, I, I, um, make a bridge here from, from the conversation that we're having now, because it seems to me that uh, in, the, in the last year, with all the challenges presented to us by the pandemic, right. social unrest that we have been living through, uh, the rising levels of unemployment, um, the, um, the extraordinarily polarized elections that we had, and the, even the most recent events, I cannot think of a better time to apply the principles, the SNAP principles into our everyday life. You're absolutely right. You know, I was looking for a slide that I have. What we're finding too is you're absolutely right. Um, the irritability that is being experienced as a result of the pandemic, you could see it, right? Yeah. And one of your scientists, Dr. Jeff Burke, actually just did a study that was published on SNAP in regards to irritability. Because when he did the first, when the first randomized control trial on SNAP was conducted in the United States in Pittsburgh, it was one of the largest randomized control trials. And so he, when he was doing that study, he said, you know what, I get the conduct kits, but there were some kids that were a little different. They were more, not typically conduct, they were more irritable irritable kids. And so he did a study uh, with one of his um, uh, colleagues, um, his students, and what they found was that in fact, there are kids that are different, that can be more irritable than conduct. And when they applied the program, it did work. It helped delete or not delete, it helped um, improve irritability and it helped to, the parents also learn how to manage that irritability a little bit more. But when you talk about the pandemic, we too know that there was a study done in, in Canada here, and what they found was that 83% of parents whose kids were already experiencing issues and problems, 83% of them got worse or are getting worse. Okay. 83% of parents of kids who are already struggling 
Okay. 83% of them report that their kids are getting worse. Okay. And then they found that 59 of parents were noting drastic changes in their kids' behaviors. 59%, right? And when we look at the whole notion, I'm going to give you these stats because I think it's really important. So, for example, here in Canada, mm -hmm. you know, just like the states, like every country, has to figure out how to help their kids and and their families. And we have some big problems. We spend over $51 billion a year in mental health costs. I don't know how much you spend in the United States. One out of five of these kids have mental health issues. We have one of the highest, third highest suicide rate in an industrial country. Okay, 50%, half of parents are concerned about their kids' anxiety. What do you think it is today as a result of the pandemic? it's probably 80 something percent, at least, if not 100% of our parents are really concerned. We have long waiting lists, right? And that if you go back in that set, seven years of warning stat I started with at the very beginning, 60%, if you go into the files of incarcerated individuals, you will see that 60% of incarcerated males had childhood, it's a history of childhood problems. 60%, so if I, had a chance or you had a chance to catch these kids, these individuals when they were younger right. and divert them, imagine that. And I think that is where I said, and the problem is, is more than 76% of parents don't even know where to start to get help for their kids. Three quarters, that's pretty serious. So I think, you know, yes, because of COVID and the pandemic, we are so concerned about our society our economy, our financial situation, our physical people are dying, but look at the mental health issues. And I don't even know what the fallout of this is going to even be yet. Yeah. Like when I see these little kids wearing masks, they don't know any better. They think that that's what, what is normal, right. right? And I don't know about you, but I can be honest. I, you know, sit here and this is my office and you can see it's all glass and it feels like I'm sitting in a dome. I can see the squirrels. I can see the birds. I'm usually muffled because I have earphones on. I'm looking at screens all day. The mental health of all of us, I think, has been impacted. I know I had to say, okay, now, Felina, you have to go for a walk every day. You have to drink your water. You have to take care of yourself. Get up. Get up. Right? right. And move. Um, so I do worry, I really do worry about the implications of what this, um, the pandemic has on all of us. We have to stay safe. We have to do our part. We have to, I don't know about you, we're supposed to wear, wear our mask. We're not supposed to go out. We're supposed to physical distance and we are, but I do worry about the long term implications on all of us, um, been, especially our kids. Have there been more requests for your, uh, services and the program? Well, you know, it was interesting um, when it hit, when the, when the pandemic hit, like everybody, it was like the world almost stopped. Yeah. Services, because you can't see people. We know, we know mental health services, most mental health services, especially when you're dealing with complex issues and complex individuals and children, you need to have relationships. You have to build that relationship. You have to be in person. You have to be able to engage with them. Doing this virtually, we had this, we had this pause and we had to pivot fast because I had all these sites all around the world looking at us to say, what do we do? And so we had that we so we had to pause and pivot fast. And we did. So we are delivering snap virtually, we yeah. created a snap for schools app, which actually is a virtual app that you can deliver in classrooms, but you can use online, um, which has great animations and has role plays in it, which will be easier to engage the kids. But at the end of the day, and I'm the first person to say this at Tony is that I do worry. Like I have heard people go, oh, we can just do virtual services all the time. I disagree. Yeah. I disagree. We have to think, go back to the risk assessment. We have to think about what is in the best interest of our children and our families and our communities. And in some cases, virtual services are perfect. But I know I'm the type of person that if I am, for example, trying to lose weight, I have to go see somebody and step on that scale, right? Yeah. Um, and um, I need that human touch. I need that human interaction. 
But this, the experiential component of all of this is uh, you can't you can't really thrive much. Not even plants thrive much if you don't yeah. interact with them closely. You know, so like I'm talking to you right now, and it looks like you're right here, and yeah, yeah. it's great. But I still think there's a shield between us, right? There's right, a screen, right? right? right. Um, and imagine if I'm upset, you can say, Lena, I'm really, that must be really hard for you, but you can't, you can't give me that Kleenex. You can't, you know, you can't, you know, tell me it's going to be okay. And, you know, um, whatever, like you just, it's just, those kind of things are really difficult. We have to think about at the end of the day, why are we doing this? So I, my question to everybody is when I do my training is why are you here? Right. What brought you here? Mm -hmm. What is it? You're not getting paid. Okay. <laughs> I know. I don't know in your field, but like it's, 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 what is your mission? What is your passion? And like I said earlier, I can train anybody to do risk assessment or to do uh, the SNAP program or to do the police community referral protocol, whatever. But I can't, I can instill that passion and that love and that heart and that grit and that courage. Because sometimes we are going to have to have a lot of courage. So one of the examples is um, raising the age of criminal responsibility from seven to 12. We did that in Canada back in 1984. That's how the SNAP program got started. There was a gap in services. So we created, looked at the best evidence in the research and decided to pull this program together to meet the kids that were falling through the cracks, the ones that, which was great. There was always pressure in the first couple of 10 years to lower the age. There still is at times. So the courage to stand up and say, no, this is not okay. And I'm the first person to say to government, you wanna lower that age, then don't have an age. You want to lower it to 10? Don't have an age. What is two years? What is one year? What is, right? As a matter of fact, we should increase the age of, of, of criminal responsibility, not lower it. Jail or criminal justice facilities aren't where kids should be. Right. So we have to think as a community, how do we want to treat our most vulnerable individuals, whether they're children or adults? Mm -hmm. And yes, they need to be kept safe for their own good. We need to be kept safe, but we need to be thinking about really effective ways to do that. And um, that's what we need. We need, just like we need great educators, we need great clinicians, we need great counselors, we need great therapists, we need great police officers, we need great fire service people, we need great community people, organizers, right? That's what makes our world go around. And at the end of the day, I think the most important thing we have to think about is kindness is kindness i think we have to be kind to ourselves so take care of yourselves and we have to be kind to those we have in front of us and we see i think one of the things Tony, that i really want to say is thank you to the melissa institute is really thank you um you know one of the quotes that i know i got from your website was you know where it said you know when they were interviewing the family um, um, after the tragedy, it was a number of months after the tragedy about Melissa Hapman in 1995. And one of the things that I'm not sure if it was the mother who said it or the father, where they said, we knew we had two choices, mm -hmm. to curse the darkness or to light a candle. Mm -hmm. And I really wanna say thank you to Melissa's parents and her family um, and all of you who um, follow that that perspective because um, we need to think about the why and we need to think about the how and the what and how do we help our kids all our kids so that things like this don't happen and I think that's where we have a responsibility so I just want to say thank you on that behalf and I am really honored to be able to do this webinar for you in, in a couple of weeks.